O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Our Lady Mother, the Most Holy Eucharist, pray for us. When we love someone, we like to give them tokens of our love. And if we wish that love to be expressed in a more excellent way, then whatever tokens that we give of that love, whether, whether they be words or material objects or whatever they may happen to be, we wish for these things not to be superficial, of course. We wish to express our proper recognition of the one whom we love, but also we wish for whatever it is that we give to the other person to be an expression of the union, the unity of hearts that expresses, that should express that love because that's the goal of love, is it not? The union of hearts. Love is all about giving of ourselves to the other, to the point not only of self-forgetfulness, but even as we learn from our Lord himself, to the point of a all-encompassing sacrifice of self. And if we love someone to the point of sacrificing ourselves for that other, then we expect some return for the love that we give. I will bet that there are some of you mothers and fathers out there who have had the experience of a love spurned. I would reckon that this is a very painful experience that you have been through, no? Some of you have poured out all your love on your children, and some of your children perhaps have not returned that love. And what does that do to your heart, you tell me? What pain does, a, does one who loves feels in their heart when the one they love does not return that love. Now, God does not give us any tokens, any particular tokens of his love, but himself. God gives of himself. God promised himself to us through the ages, and he gave of himself. Jesus in the Gospels tells us that greater love than this no one knows for one to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did one better than that because he did not lay his life down for his friends, but he laid down his life for all, friend or enemy. And he laid down, that, laid down his life, understand, knowing full well already that many would spurn his love. How many of you would be willing to offer up your life knowing that the one for whom you offer up your life would definitely spurn your love? I reckon that none of us would have that sort of love, that sort of courage on our own. But this is what God has done. Understand further that God has gone beyond even that. He went all the way, even though he knew he, we would not. But then, what he has done, leaving what you might say a substantial token of, more than a token, of course, because he leaves himself, but he makes his love come alive. God's love is living. God is love. And the love that God demonstrated in laying down his life, becomes present to us. It is here among us. It's on our altar right now. So that very same sacrificial love 
that God demonstrated approximately 2,000 years ago, that very same love is present right now. So we are at no disadvantage compared to those of 2,000 years ago. That very same love in its fullness is present right now. And we have to understand that he's not on our altar for nothing. He wishes, the one who loves, wishes to be loved. He has created us. He has given us minds and hearts. He has given us the ability to love, that we may love him. This is all our joy and happiness. Not to place all our love in the one who has created and redeemed us, is not to find the happiness for which we were created. God does not leave our God does not need our love. God is happy in himself. He's not quote unquote missing something as if he needs us to complete what is missing and he's he's complete all in himself. He's perfectly happy. He has no need of us. He has no need of our love. But we have need to love him. Because that's the nature of love. Love looks to give of oneself. This is why God created and redeemed. Love does not remain contained within itself. Love pours itself out to the very last drop. Jesus spared nothing in his love for us. He did not say, I will ration my love. I will love only to the degree that I see others will love me. He didn't do that. He loved us to the very last drop of his blood. And he has given us the wherewithal that we can return his love proportionately. Because some may say to themselves, I realize that Jesus loves me, but how can I love God the way that he loves me? This is impossible. I say some will say that. But he has given us that means to love him. The very Lord who loves me, who is present now, becomes my nourishment, whereby I, united to him, can love him in the way that he loves. Now, how did our Lord come into the world? We answered that question earlier, didn't we? He only came one way, right? Through Mary. And what did we say about our Blessed Lady? She said she, we said that she was redeemed in a very special way, preservatively redeemed. And this preservative redemption, which was a gift for one person, one person alone, we sum up in these two words, Immaculate Conception. Here's a little secret, not really a secret, but something that not enough people realize. The way that God diffuses his love upon us through coming to Our Lady, there is no better way he could have worked it out. See, God could have created a better world than the one that we actually live in. But, as the theologians and doctors of the Church tell us, he could not have created a more perfect creature than he actually did when he created our Blessed Lady. This one was fitted to be the perfect receptacle of God's love, but not destined for her alone, understand, but for all of us as well. See? God intended to bless us through her from all eternity. And no, mark well what I'm about to say, in case someone wonders, well, why didn't God diffuse his love directly upon us? Isn't that more perfect? No. The most perfect way God's love arrives 
at us is through our blessed light. In this one person whom he re redeemed perfectly, God's love arises as most perfectly. There is no more perfect way that God's love can arrive at us, in our hearts. Guess what, th guess what this means with regard to the return? We have to return that love in the same way in which it has come to us. St. Maximilian Kolbe neatly summarizes this when he calls Our Lady the vertex of love. What he means by that is that all the love of God comes to us is summed up in this creature, his mother, and comes to us. And all the love of creation, all the love that creation returns to God is summed up in her heart. That heart of Mary is a sum of divine love with which God loves us and is a sum of all human love whereby we ought to love God. See, God finds the perfect response to his love for all mankind in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And in no other heart. Her heart was fitted to love in this way, and she actually did love in this way. Thus we deny those who would suppose that God could have come to us through any creature. He could have chosen anyone. If he didn't choose Mary, he could, have choose, he could have chosen someone else. No, only one. Because God doesn't do things in any half-hearted way. He only does things in the most perfect way. Only one creature who is so perfect that none will ever be more perfect. Only one. He looked for someone to love in the most perfect way, someone to stand in our stead. Because after original sin, there was no hope that we would give that unreserved yes that Our Lady gave. But only she could give it anyway. God knew that from all eternity. And remember what we said earlier. His delight is in showing mercy. He delighted in filling this heart with his grace. And he delights in the love which this heart continues to return to him. The love that that heart returned him ever since the immaculate conception of this woman. See, God does not look for any superficial tokens, but he wants our whole selves. But in order that we may give our whole selves, return our whole selves to God, there's one way that we must do it, and only one. By letting ourselves love God with the heart of this woman. Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, reminded us that Mary is present at every Holy Mass. Did, did we realize this? You know this? We don't see Mary with our bodily eyes. A, a canonized saint is telling us these things. Mary is present at every Holy Mass. Doing what? Adoring her Lord, preparing us to worthily do the same, so that we may unite ourselves to our Lord with her heart. Is Our Lady not present among us now, inspiring us with these same sentiments, telling us to place ourselves into her immaculate heart, to let her mold our hearts in the likeness of hers, mold our sinful hearts in the likeness of her immaculate heart. 
so that we can at last, at long last, return something worthily to our Lord. Is that all that she wanted us to do? No. At Fatima. Make of her heart a refuge. But more than a refuge, really. A burning, fiery furnace of love for our Lord. That's what our hearts are created for. To burn with love forever for our Lord. So the Blessed Sacrament present among us is our Lord present among us, inviting us. Our Lord pouring himself out for us even now. Yes, he ended his the earthly part of his existence many centuries ago. But he, God and man, is present among us, sacramentally present. With all that same love with which he is which burns so ardently for each and every one of us individually and taken together. And there our lady is. Here she is in our midst. Adoring our Lord, returning that love, beckoning us to join her in profound adoration, telling us that this is how we will, how we will be truly happy, letting us acknowledge her as what St. Maximilian acknowledged her to be the vertex of love that place where the love of God and the love of creatures meet, that heaven, that paradise. Shall we not allow our hearts to be made into a paradise where our Lord will rejoice in us and where we will, where we will rejoice in our Lord forever? Amen.